Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayedge, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their story, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today, we have the pleasure of being with my friend, the human capital wizard, the amazing Steve Ricks. Steve Ricks has spent three decades honing and developing his skills as an expert in employee engagement. From startups to Fortune 100 companies, Steve has provided coaching and consulting in the development of people to perform at their highest levels. For the last decade, he has explored, researched, and experimented with play in the workplace as the highest state of effectiveness and efficiency. From coaching and consulting to focus groups and beta testing, over 250 unique case studies lead Steve to develop a particular set of experiments and experiences that when delivered to a workplace culture, undeniably facilitate useful changes in culture. Recently, Steve released his first book, Play Saves the Day. His inspiration for this book came from the dangerously alarming state of mental health in the workplace. Now more than ever, companies have a moral mandate to take care of their human capital. Putting people over profits will unequivocally create more profit and happier people in the workplace. Play as a state of being is the most powerful foundation for human transformation. Steve is on a mission to be the prophet of play to help heal the global mental health pandemic. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, man, it is my pleasure, Jamil. Much aloha from Hawaii. I'm thrilled to be here. And as you read that back, I think to myself, damn straight, Skippy. Like, that's what it's <laughs> I love profit of play. That sounds so cool. And so you absolutely are that, um, you know, over the last year or so that I've gotten to know you. Uh, first of all, it's finally getting warm over here in New York, but I got the opportunity to be in Hawaii for a short period of time. I'm sorry and we missed each other, but next time for Next sure. time, but the weather there is amazing. So you, I hope you're taking advantage. <laughs> it's so nice. Always, there. Always. So how are you doing? Doing well. Um, you know, uh, for uh, our listening audience, uh, Hawaii has been my home for the better, almost 10 years now, but um, I was off island, 13 different states, three countries during the pandemic. Um, like right in the, in the trenches of it all. And uh, I found that during that time, more than any time in my life, my own mental health was challenged. And um, so it's great now. I've been back here, I think almost uh, nine months and uh, it feels like I haven't missed a beat and things are finally starting to get back to whatever the new normal is. At least a lot of people are coming and going, a lot of energy, a lot of activity. And uh, so it's good to see uh, Hawaii uh, getting back on track because it um, it, it took a, a just a brunt, brutal force of all this. I think uh, while it's gone, they shut down to the most stringent requirements three or four times and uh, lost over 700 businesses. And there's a lot of weary people here. So I'm where I need to be to really start making some impact. And I'm excited about it. Absolutely, man. I'm excited to share, you know, not only your story and everything you're working on with, you know, my, my community, but just it's so inspiring. And I think the audience is going to get that feel from what we talk about today. You got a lot going on. A lot of exciting things are going on in your world and you're making a real big difference right now. And so can't wait to dive in. And so for the people who don't know you, they haven't heard your story. Would you mind sharing with us what brought you, you know, from where you were to where you are now? What are some of the challenges, the adversities, the inspirations for why you do what you do today? Sure. Um, I, I've, um, I've worked at becoming condensed and in, in trying to pack in in just a few minutes a, a broad brush sense of my life. I, I always like to start with um, my life is a glorious celebration of experiments gone awry, right? Like, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in between some of those experiments, if it didn't work, have been some real beautiful highlights in my life. I've, I've, I've been married twice, wonderful. 
I've been able to achieve some really financial um, uh, freedom places in my life. That was wonderful. I've been able to travel the world. I started seven, this is the seventh company I've started of my own, um, consulted with literally several hundred companies, have two amazing grown children. And yet, if you want to get to the real core of my life, all those things I said at any time or another, those great achievements, I managed to squander away with self-sabotage. And what I realized was the only common denominator was me. And so if you want to understand a little bit of who Steve Ricks is, he's this guy who constantly felt like there was, there was a world of more and better and different available to me. And every time I went to manifest it and tasted it, touched it, felt it, realized it, it was like, okay, I can do this. But then when I kept finding ways to choose an alternate reality where I was without these wonderful experiences in my being, um, I began saying, I don't like the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, it's exhausting. It, it attacks your level of self-love and esteem. It makes you doubt who you are, doubt direction, doubt relevance. Um, and at the very simple level, you begin asking, am I really lovable? Um, am I really worthy? And um, it was 10 years ago when I asked myself this question, because uh, I kind of, I've, I've been exposed to a lot of, um, we'll call it the personal development industry, you know, the Tony Robbins and the Bob Proctors and, you know, all these great contributors to, I'll call it the expanding of human consciousness, right? And, and have these short-term wins, but I was never able to sustain long-term results. And so for your listening audience, I guess who Steve Ricks is, is a guy who 10 years ago said, Ben, pardon my French, but no shit, no kidding. I'm going to figure it out. Like, why isn't it working? And for a guy who hated science in, um, in high school, only had to take one elective of it in college and was thrilled that I'd had to take no more. Mm. Over the last 10 years, I've become wildly curious about neuroscience, how the brain works, how human transformation actually takes place, like what's going on up there. And actually, there's a huge correlation to what's going on here in the heart, which is also a secondary, you know, primary nervous system where we feel a lot. And um, so I began this journey. And who Steve is today um, is a guy who for 10 years has literally commended himself to experimenting with play. Because as I talk about in the opening of my book, I was literally on the beach bemoaning the fact that I was now separated and going through a second divorce and, you know, cataloging all the failures not focused on any of my successes. And two little kids came up to me and they said, hey, mister, you want to play? And if you've ever been around kids, and I'm sure a lot of your audience has kids, they have this infectious energy about them. So this moat immediately turned into a, sure, why not? And 15, 20 minutes later, after we danced with the waves and made this really crappy sandcastle, but they thought it was, <laughs> they thought it was the bomb, right? Like, mm. like they were just, thrilled that they had enrolled someone in their mission to have fun. And as I walked back to my, my place there um, on the North Shore here in Hawaii, I started writing some notes because what I observed was the pain that had been building over two decades and had culminate, culminated in these teetering in and out of severe depression. In 15 minutes, it was totally altered. And for a moment, I began to say, wait a minute, does play really create enough mental pliability to like shatter the calcified ideology that I wasn't worth it? Mm. Like, could play really, you know, pierce the veil of what is to what isn't and make me see that right there, everything is available to me? Because it didn't mean that all the collateral damage of these past choices had you know, gone away. I mean, the truth is, is choices I've made years ago, I'm still working on repairing some of those things, because sometimes it takes time to fix the things you messed up. But the one thing that I noticed was that every time I played, I reset the sense of well-being, like, 
when I played, I didn't feel guilt. I didn't feel shame. I didn't feel, um, you know, like limited. Everything was open and possible. And there's an enormous correlation between play and curiosity, imagination. I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but that's Steve Ricks in a nutshell, a roller coaster that said, I want off. I want to go on the ski lift that just keeps going up. Yeah, and yeah. sure, life has peaks and valleys, but um, I can say the last 10 years experimenting with play has been the single greatest um, transformative element in my life over 55 years. So that's me in a bit of a nutshell. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, Steve. There's so many things I want to comment on. I love it. Um, one thing that you said that I hope our audience you know, really hones in on the bunch you said, but the one, there's a few that I want to point, uh, pinpoint when those two kids approached you. And if I'm, uh, if I misquote you, just, Hey, mister, you know, do you want to play or some variation of that? Yeah. This idea of, in a way, those two kids were, that was like the, the entry point into like the rest of your life, like that shifted things. Mm -hmm. And when we can recognize, and this is, you know, I, I strongly recommend people you know, stay open to you never know what's going to come and show up into your life that's going to take you on the journey of a lifetime. You never know what person or experience or you get called to do something and that shifts everything for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just you being on the beach is you being open because you're not surrounded by other people. You know, there's like almost like an invitation to be approached. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think you make a really good point. And I'd, I'd add just one little nuance that I'm really convinced of, like, one could say, wow, you could have gone the other way and might still be on that roller coaster. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is, as I've come to understand the science and the biology of play, it was impossible for me to go the other way because the energetic draw and the invitation to be playful when it comes and is delivered in its purest form can melt the hardest of heart can alter the course of even the sternest of, dis, of, of, of stubborn people, like play by its nature is irresistible. Mm -hmm. Now, there might be people who are harder and in a different situation than me, and they might have shooed them off. But I can tell you this, enough experiments of enough invitations of enough playful, limitless, you know, unintended energy, eventually play always wins. Mm -hmm. I'd never bet against it. Yeah. And there's a word that you use several times in the beginning and just now that I want to allude to, because you mentioned the word is experiment and you mentioned, you know, science earlier. And I want people to recognize there's an immense shift that happens in your life when you treat, you know, let's say your days or your, how you live like an experiment, because when a scientist experiments, there is no failure. When a scientist yeah. experiments, there's just, Hey, I'm setting out to do this thing to see what's going to happen. And this is what I'd like to see happen, but let's see. And then you yeah. try and you do what you do and you get a result. And either, you know, it's like, oh, wow, perfect, spot on. Or it's like, oh, da new data. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you learn from it and then you have a new experiment. And so I'm for everyone- I'm so glad that resonated with you because um, I grew up in a world and, and frankly, most human beings are affected by one or both of these things. Religion plays an enormous role in society. I mean, in America alone, just five years ago, the Census Bureau said there were 3,600 unique teachings on religion. Like, I don't mean Baptist and Bible count, like they're one and the same, right? Like, like and, and, and Catholicism and, and like Protestant, like there's a lot of people looking at a lot of religious upbringing. And the second one that almost everyone is exposed to is education. Now notice the nuance of what happens with the child. In school, I come from this world of being totally curious. Whereas a little kid, I'll put my dad's wallet in my mouth because I've never seen a wallet before. Let's taste it, let's smell it, let's touch it, right? Like everything's about curiosity. And the first time in school, we were mandated to begin this rote memory experience of countless, what I'll call otherwise useless pieces of information. The first time I raise my hand enthusiastically to answer the correct question correctly, and I get it wrong, children don't know how to behave, so they all giggle at you. And it immediately you know, cements this idea of, I'm not raising my hand anymore. 
Yeah. And if you think about it, for 400 years with classic education, ever since Europe and, and the Middle East really began educational institutions, right? And then they came to the Americas and, and, and around the rest of the world. It's never been about curious questions. It's always been about being correct with your answers. So when you train your mind to look for correctness, you're now in a performance mode instead of an experiment mode. And that's why I alluded to the church as well, because many churches, not all, but many religions put a huge emphasis on your performance, right? Your faith is demonstrated through your works. You must be good. And when you're not good, guilt and shame show up. And I came out of the church world. And so it was really hard for me to not see myself as a bad guy because I constantly didn't measure up. But to your point, when I put myself in experiment mode, I activate curiosity. And it's interesting. I, I just read a book, um, Art, Art of the Impossible by Stephen Kotler. And, and, and in it, he alludes to the fact that like when I'm curious about something, when I say, oh, well, there's a little cup and what's in it? I've never seen a cup before. The same amount of dopamine that I release in the system by a human being doing like a line of cocaine, I get four times that by exercising my own curiosity. Mm -hmm. And why do people wow. do things like cocaine? They do it because they're sad and they're unhappy and they want to rush. And yet your body designed perfectly through play and curiosity can give yourself pleasure dumps all over the place, which is why we've really changed our narrative that like life is one big experiment. So dive in because feedback's a gift. If it works, you keep going with it. And to your point, if it doesn't, you try something else. So that's a really good thing you brought up there. And I love the way you took that. That's fantastic. And I hope people really latch on to if your intention, let's say, is to get it right, to look good, like whatever it is, especially like on the first try or in the beginning, yeah, you're putting yourself in this like self-imposed prison because you're not going to no, be willing no. to try. So think about it like this. Um, you know, some people are listening and some people are watching on the video, but you know, I got my hands up right now in like a circle kind of form. And if this circle represents, you know, what I know, like my knowledge base, well, there's obviously like a much larger, let's say, circle around it. And that's what I don't know. So my fingers represent that comfort zone, the edge, where when I go past it, I'm in kind of uncharted territory. But every time I go past it, the edge expands. And now I have a bigger circle. And so the thing is, if I'm afraid to try because I don't want to look bad, because when I was a kid, I raised my hand, like Steve said, I got laughed at because I got the wrong answer. Or maybe even worse, maybe the teacher was like, no, little Timmy, you're wrong and bad or yeah. whatever that they, they say to you, which I've heard some horror stories. Yeah, some punitive responses, right? Yeah. It, it puts us into this headspace that, you know what, let me just only do what I'm certain of. But life is inherently uncertain. And so when you're trying to only do what you're certain about, you will never push the boundary beyond what you're comfortable with, which means you're never going to really grow beyond what you're already, who you already are. And that's going to keep you playing small. And then you wonder, you know, where's the fun? Where's the play? Where's the growth? Where's the expansion? I'm not really getting any of that because that really only comes when you embrace the uncertainty, embrace the unknown, when you dive in fully. I often tell people, when you think about a child, let's say making a snow angel, or a sandcastle or something like that, an adult might say, what's the purpose? There is no purpose. You're yeah. playing for the sake of play itself. Yeah. You're and and we talk about defining play with five key tenants. And the first key tenant is doing something for nothing. Right. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Like <laughs> there is no intended result. And, um, and I think in general, and this is why I love the theme of your podcast, right? Because Transformation is, especially in our lifetime, Jamil, and, and probably for the last century or so, this premise of waking up consciousness and, and living a, a better life, it has become amplified as like, as the author of Stealing Fire talks about, like chasing the gods to get the ungettable. And why is that? Because over the last hundred years, as we've had communication mediums, as we've had the commercialization and the globalization of the world and information travels in a millisecond, 
we're now exposed to so many data points of what everybody else's life appears to look like. And half the time, that's not even real, right? But we begin to get this sense of, I don't measure up. And so what do we do? We dive into work to attempt to do that. For the first time in the modern history, the United States has overcome Japan as the most workaholic place in the world. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't surprise me. That happened last year. And, <clears throat> um, and if you think about the narrative of play, in, in many societies, certainly uh, amongst um, North America, for sure, play is that childlike behavior that's a tool to develop adolescence and mature into adulthood. And then as uh, one actual religious transcript says, then we leave childish things behind. Um, which is a, a very poor application of the pure essence of play. The second narrative we give play is the pat on the back, the carrot, the reward at the end of the work week, or if we're really lucky at the end of the year, maybe a couple of weeks vacation. Yeah. And then there's the ultra elite who enjoy seemingly playing all the time, right? And, um, and all of those narratives are certainly observable, but none of them give play its due like play is that fountain of youth for the transformational process okay. when we begin to understand all of the things that it unlocks physiologically and psychologically man i'm telling you it is it, it's pandora's box in the best possible way yeah something that you just kind of brought up in my mind i'd love to share with the audience I often tell my clients, I want you to, you know, I have a window right here. And I'll say, I want you to look outside and I want you to point to, let's say a tree and they'll do it. Now I want you to point to, let's say the car and the rock and they'll do it. And I'll say in, in the context of our conversation, point to fun, point to play. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And, I want, and the thing I'm trying to get across to them and not to everyone listening, those things don't exist outside of you. There's right. nothing in the world that in and of itself is play or fun. Play is how you relate to the world. Yes. And when you give yourself permission to play, which is the key, when you, when you, a lot of times, you know, we're growing up and depending on our upbringing and society and where we went to school and what kind of we hear that comes into us, we might think, oh, you know, I'm an adult now. And we have a story about why that's childish, you know, or I can't do that or, what would people think if there I am like playing on the monkey bars and I'm 34? <laughs> it's like, whatever it is, you know? But if we can come from that headspace of, you know what? I'm going to give my, myself permission to just have a good time. And it reminds me of, you mentioned, you know, different religions. I think it was a, a Jesus, a Bible quote, but it's be childlike, not childish. And yeah. that thing of childish might be more of like, you're naive, but childlike is like, there's an innocence. Childlike, yes. there's a playfulness. There's a, a willingness to experiment to be curious, to ask questions and being okay, not knowing and stuff like that. But I'd love to you know, pass it back to you. Yeah. Oh, well, even saying that, like, because as you were talking, I looked out my window, I thought, well, there's a palm tree. Well, there's a car there, oh, the, over there's a rock. And when you said fun, I was like, wow, what a brilliant illustration because the reality is, you know, in the book and in a lot of my messaging, I actually use, um, object lessons via childlike toys. Like if I were to turn my camera, you'd see I've created a little play altar for myself. And over there, my favorite book in the world, Oh, the Places We Go by Dr. Seuss. I've got a Pirates of the Caribbean lunchbox, but it's not <laughs> for lunch because it's got all my favorite little gizmos and gadgets. I've got Silly String. I've got a Slinky. I've got a Minion. Now that's the elementary exposure to play through toys, right? But play for some people could be jumping out of an airplane. For others, it could be going into a forest and foraging food and going back and cooking it. For still others, it could be basket weaving, you know, aeronautical science. Like when we look at pure play, play brings us present it connects us to our imagination it allows us to feel emotionally safe 
and it invites us to invite others to be around us. Now, when it's play for just pure play sake, it's that fifth thing I talked about. There's no meaning. Yeah. But if you think about now practicing that with things we love to do, now we begin to pay attention to my consciousness. How am I feeling when I am in a state of play? I'm likely feeling curious, likely feeling limitless, likely feeling very engaging and inviting, and possibly even feeling the possibility of what you talked about, getting past my body of conscious knowledge, right? And who can possibly lose mm. when those tenants are in place, right? So now, um, and we talk about this in the book, that like use play to wake up that level of consciousness, but then be purposeful with play. I was invited by... Um, one of my board members for Play Lab to watch an episode. And I want, I want everybody to think about this. Um, there's a Netflix series called Chef's Table. Um, my dad's a, a former professional chef and he watches it all the time. I've watched a few episodes. But last night he called me, so you gotta watch this episode. It so speaks to play and the workplace and, and mental wellness. It's about this restaurant and its founder um, for a long time in the US, French Laundry outside of Sonoma wine country was considered one of the world's greatest restaurants, number one in the U.S. for a while. And along, excuse me, came this gentleman, Grant is his first name, I forget how to pronounce his last name, it begins with A, and he started a restaurant called Alinea. Well, Alinea is the symbol that you put at the front of a paragraph, and he named his restaurant Alinea because through his classic training at French Laundry and a few other people, uh, amazing chefs what he learned is that the beauty of culinary work is not to simply create some masterpieces for which you get known but to always be creating some new masterpieces and he literally learned how to create you know aroma and and, and puff pillows that were the place settings so every time you'd cut, you'd smell the food. He created through sugar, a balloon that you'd actually eat as part of your dessert. He said, forget like, um, you know, tableware, we're going to make the table itself, the entire presentation. And I was so blown away because what, what they told about his story is that he got oral cancer mm -hmm. and um, they said he was gonna die. And so they gave a press release and some people at a nearby hospital in Chicago said, we're trying these experimental treatments. Fast forward to today, not only did he not die, he's shut down his restaurant to reopen it, to do it all new again. And I couldn't help but think um, his taste buds didn't come back right away. And then when they came back fully, as he's sharing his journey, I thought, here's a guy who hasn't worked a day in his life. Because he has been, now he's been very busy working, but he's engaged in something he loves. And not only did it create just being at the top of his game, it's allowing him to reinvent himself. It likely saved his life and his mental health. And uh, in the book, we talk about how we all have play personalities. I always tell people, if you're working in an environment where you don't feel comfortable emotionally, or you don't like your job, man, I don't care what the circumstances are, get out. Because one of the keys to human transformation is putting yourself in an environment that you're curious and engaged in. Mm -hmm. And if you spend the majority of your working, waking, waking hours working, and you don't like what you're doing, everything else you're doing is like you're counterbalancing it, you're offsetting it, you may get two steps forward and take a step back, or even worse, take two forward and three back as we spend so much time in environments that we really don't want to be in. So a little bit tangential, but I think it's so important because mental health in the workplace, um, if, if your listeners really want to change, we have to be custodians of our personal culture. Mm -hmm. Like we have to keep the garden for which we want to grow, which sometimes means we need to till new soil, break up fallow ground, which might mean changing jobs. And, I know that's a whole bunch, but hopefully it's relevant to you. No, no, absolutely. One thing that you hit on there that I think is I really want to point out for the listeners, you talked about reinvention. And I mentioned that actually in my last interview, 
uh, with Carol Mack, this idea that reinvention can be play. Reinvention, when you think about your life up until this point, some of you are listening and you might be saying, you know, there's not a lot of play in my life. I'm not really having fun. I don't know the last time I felt expansion and growth and, you know, pushing the comfort zone and everything we're talking about. And the beauty about that is, okay, you know, I hear you. That's where you're, that's where you're at right now. Would you like to have some play? Would you like to have yeah. some fun? This is, the, this is the metaphorical equivalent of the two kids coming up to you. Hey, mister, yeah. you want to play? This is now they're hearing this at the right time. And we're saying, hey, do you want to play? And if the answer is no. yes, be playful. If you yes. want to play, be playful. Instead of expecting others to kind of entertain you, what if you started being playful in your nature? It's really great that you say that because like, just like that gentleman who's the owner of the Alinea restaurant, Grant, has just become the best at what he does. I've made it my mission to be both a living example and um, a major conduit for the message that play does save the day. Like I have dedicated the last 10 years and the rest of my life to learning everything I can about the centrality of play in a happy, growing, abundant life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you mentioned, and it's true, like if you held a gun to some of us, we wouldn't find our way back to the play state because we get ingrained by our parents act your age not your shoe size right and well this is a place for grown-ups and like you get conditioned that like um to let your hair down is crazy i've been on a bunch of podcasts this week and one of which was with a, a former uh, drummer in a rock band and um and so i thought i'm gonna be a goofball and i got this wig and i put this wig on with these sunglasses and he said, he said, you look more like Howard Stern than you do a rock star. I said, I'll take that too. Because, you know, part of play is, is just being spontaneous and, and, and not taking yourself so seriously. And, and in a state of play, you can be certain you give your body, your mind, your spirit, all of you, the totality of you, the easiest path to synchronicity. Because play by its nature is movement oriented, right? I like to say, if you saw a little lower than here, you'd see I put on a COVID-20, right? Because it was so sedentary. And <laughs> I'm actually going to the gym after this. I've been working. It was COVID-30. So we're down 10, but we still got a, a little ways to go. But like, even for me, because the last few years, um, I've been cooped up like a lot of people. Prior to that, I had a routine. I would swim on Sunset Beach three days a week. I would hike Pupakea Cliffs three days a week. And the seventh day was an optional day. Was I going to go snorkeling? Was I going to go for a light, you know, jog or trail run? Was I just going to get lost, you know, in, in the island? But like, I never had to think about exercise because I was leaning into playful ways to keep myself lean, right? Well, now um, I'm uh, probably here in the city of Honolulu for another uh, two months. And then I'm headed back to the North shore, my playground. Yeah. So in the meantime, I use a gym, but I've had to gamify that. Otherwise I won't go. Right. So learning the ways that you find yourself playful can really be useful. And I had someone ask me this on a podcast I was on this week. Well, what if I have just lost my way with play? I'll give you three quick tips. One, if you had a great childhood, just go write down five great memories of childhood play and find something that's like it and go play with that. I didn't have a great childhood, but I had at least three great memories from childhood play. One, my dad's house had a big old marshy woods behind it and I'd get lost for hours. Once my dad had to come in with a flashlight because I got so lost. Mm -hmm. But like at five, six years old, running into the woods, you felt free. Like you felt like, wow, you know, in some sense, you're like, I must be a grown up. I'm doing this all by myself. But one of the play states is the explorer, the idea of, oh, this is new. This is different, right? Mm -hmm. The other way I loved to play was any place where I could stick my head underwater. Like, it's probably why I became a scuba dive instructor and, and, and logs 10,000 dives, right? So you may not have had a great upbringing, but if you have a few great memories. Now, last one, if you say, bad upbringing, no great memories from childhood that I want you to think about the last five times you laughed your ass off, had a great time, had a big smile on your face, and it was not in a work environment. 
And likely out of at least one of those, we can help you discover play that will activate you right now. And chances are with most people I talk to, it's three or four of those experiences. Like, oh, I never thought of that as play, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, man. There's two comments I'd love to share with you in the audience. And then I I have a question for you about your book. The first thing is for anyone listening who might be feeling, you know, you're feeling burned out, you're feeling overworked, you're feeling tired, you're like, I don't have the energy. To me, that is a symptom of a play deficiency. Mm -hmm. And if we can step into, that's a sign, because play recharges you. Play, like you talked about exploring, being, you're moving, you're being in action. So there you are thinking, no, no, I've got, I'm drained, I'm burned out. I just need to sit on the couch and veg out. You could do that. You're free to do that. And you probably feel a hell of a lot better and way more energized by actually going and funny enough, expending energy to yes. go and play. And it, it's rejuvenating to your spirit. Great, great point. I tell people um, in my entrepreneurial journey, I alluded to in our intro that started um, seven companies, this being the seventh, um, you know, two of them were catastrophic failures. Two, I got out even and, and two made me a little money. And the one that was the catastrophic failure, the big one, actually, I was six months away from retiring at 37 years old. And then all of a sudden the markets crashed and and it turned into an epic fail. I I had like a $7 million bankruptcy. It was horrible. Um, And yet it was very helpful because what I've learned by looking at all the things I've done in the past is the longest I did anything was like four years and three months. And as I reflect back on it, it's only because of one of three reasons. We had success or we had failure by then, or I just was like, all right, I've had enough. Like, it's not for me. When I began this company approaching nine years ago, I remember people said, because my my particular application was how you use play and imagination in the workplace to help improve performance. That's where I started. Today, that's clearly one of the byproducts, but uh, Play Lab's mission is to create happy, playful humans everywhere. So we got a lot of work to do. We do it by redefining play so we can reimagine work and thus redesign the human experience. Now, in these last nine years, I've probably had seven different business plans. I still owe some past investors for things that quite didn't work, but we tried experiments, right? That's part of what I told you, some decisions you still got to take care of. But not once in the last nine years, not once, as hard as it has been, I became a millionaire in half that time and lost it in half that time. But not once in the last nine years have I thought, this is hard. Yeah. And yet there have been many elements of challenge, right? People telling you it's not going to work, taking $25,000, $50,000 and investing in an experiment and it doesn't work, right? That's, that's not fun necessarily, but the underlying premise of, I know this is going to work. It's just a matter of experiments till I figure out which ones. Yeah, yeah. Has had me fully engaged. And to your point, some weeks I'll be, quote, working 70, 80, 90 hours a week. And yet I wake up ready to go. Yeah. Because I'm like, here we go. We get to play with play some more and, and, and really spin the possibility of how lives can be changed because of it. And I think, wow, my God, am I so blessed to not have to work, but to play. And I like to say this, and and then I'll hand it back to you. Work is not the opposite of play. The opposite of play is resistance. Mm -hmm. Like I am so fully engaged in what I do. I work my ass off, but it don't feel like work. It just feels like curiosity and engagement and, and excitement to see like, we just launched five uniquely different experiments the last two weeks to help proliferate this new book I've released. And I'm not particularly worried about which ones succeed and which ones don't. I'm just excited that we got five experiments to look at because if those work, we'll keep pushing them out. And if they don't, we'll go get five more because one way or the other, we're going to get this book to the world, right? Like that's what play does to you. That's yeah. what play did to that guy, Grant, who owns that business. When he decided he could live and he could cook without taste buds, He became way more creative and his family life was better. I mean, it's just an amazing episode. People need to watch it, but yeah. (laughs) If you haven't noticed, I'm kind of sold on play. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, something that came to mind that I wanted to share with the audience, and I often tell you know clients of mine this, and I point things out. Notice how we create our world by generating it through language. And so the word play and the word work are just labels. They're just work. At the end of the day, they're just your life. And so how you relate to it, if we relate to life as play, like Steve is suggesting, and we live our life in such a way that we take the full ownership and we put ourselves in a situation that we really want to be in, that we enjoy, that we love, life becomes this beautiful dance. And the thing that comes to mind is in my own experience, you know, similar to yourself, I feel very blessed that my work is my play. They're one and the same. And so when I come from that headspace, I disappear because I'm one with the process. Can you hear me, Steve? I think we froze. Yeah, it seems like Steve froze, but I'll just keep sharing. There we go. Can you hear me, Steve? Yeah, it seems like you did too. Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. And so um, all I was saying though, when we become one with that process, it's almost like we disappear. We're in that flow state. And I love yeah. that. Yeah. And we're just yeah. so... Yeah, so we're just in that flow state. We're deeply present. And in a way, you lose yourself. And by losing yourself, you're just one with the dance. You're one with the, the experience of life. It seems like we're freezing again a little bit. Yeah, so just, uh, just lost Steve. <laughs> He'll be back in a moment. But I'd love everyone in the audience, or rather everyone listening, rather, be with yourself and, and ask, how can I play more? What are the areas of my life? that I could really experiment with? What's some stuff that I've been meaning to do? Some stuff I've been longing to do. Steve mentioned earlier, he likes to snorkel and go to the beach and hike. Maybe that's you. Maybe you say, you know what? I wanna to go to a cooking class. I wanna to go to a dance class. I wanna experiment with my friends. I wanna enjoy myself. Maybe there's some experiences that you haven't had in a long time that like Steve said, you think back and there's some really happy memories that you have and you go, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. That by, the, that by itself right there could be a game changer for you to step into fully. All right, we're back. We had a temporary internet issue, but we are back up and running, diving into this amazing conversation with the wonderful Steve Ricks. And so Steve, as it relates to this fantastic book that you've just released, Play Saves the Day, I'd love for you to share with our audience, and a lot you've already maybe mentioned, what inspired you to write this book? And I'd love for you to share as well, that fascinating statistic you shared with me earlier before our call about the nine out of 10. So please take yeah, it. Yeah, sure. And for your audience, my apologies, uh, technology one, Steve zero, uh, we'll, we'll, make up, we'll make up for it finishing strong. Um, <laughs> to, to start with, um, the inspiration for the book was born out of a couple things. One, as an eight-year-old company at the time I started writing it, we're now into our ninth year, it became clear to me that we're talking about something that is so foreign as far as a tool in the workplace, as far as a tool in personal or professional development, people just don't think of play that way. So um, we've all heard it and, and known it to be true. The minute you become an author, somehow people give more credence to what comes out of your mouth. So I will not lie when I say, I wanted to have a decided leverage when having conversations with companies that I'm just not like shooting from the hip because yeah. I'm, I'm a very gregarious human being and, and then that can come off like a salesman and that's not what I mean. Um, so part of the motive was strategic. The other motive was in um, the last eight years, I've looked for every piece of work I can. And by work, I mean offering in the way of other books on play and its relevance to the message we've been talking about. And Jamil, I can't really find much aside from um, Dr. Stuart Brown, who I think in 2001 wrote a book by the, the name Play, fantastic book. Um, and yet where he took it, I felt like, as, and it was exceptional. I mean, it's, it's a full body of work where mine is more playful and anecdotal. His was, I had a lot of science to it and a lot of different things. And we're already starting to work on um, a more uh, substantive book that way and, and, and introducing some studies. But I was driven by wanting to have something that I could truly stand behind and say is credible because I've had eight years of experimenting and play in my own life. And as you alluded to in the intro, 
uh, well over 250 case studies of working with other people or small groups, in some cases, small businesses, a couple cases, a little larger, but like experimenting and seeing like consistently transformative results. So um, there was that. The second thing that motivated the book was um, like, I don't know where I woke up to the fact that when other people hurt, I feel it, AKA empathic energy, right? Like um, you see it, you see the pain. And for a moment, I would like, I'd transport myself to wonder what it would have been like to have just started a brand new business right before the pandemic and have had my whole life savings in it, be told it's deemed non-essential and now be broke or to be a young mother and suddenly your husband and father of three kids gone, to have been married to your sweetheart for 50 years and they die in a hospital room by themselves, to be a teacher in Chicago where 86% of all teachers queried said during the pandemic, they use some form of prescription or illegal narcotic to manage their own stress through the pandemic, like what's going on in their lives, to be an even tempered man who now is at home every day with his kids and frustrated because he can't work and frustrated because the kids are around and for the first time in his life, never would have thought about it, but he strikes his kid, right? Like I, I cried and I thought play can fix all that shit. Yeah. And that's what got me writing about it. And, um, and when I wrote, I tried to write from feeling what those people might feel because for all the glorious mess ups in my life, I like, I've never felt any of those kinds of pains before. Um, I felt pain, much of it self-induced, but nothing like what I just described. And so initially the, the title of the book was, was uh, the pandemic playbook your guide into a happy uh, life of mental well-being, right? And, and of course, we shift that because I think a lot of people are tired of talking about the pandemic. However, there is a greater pandemic that was here before, was ignored before, and cannot any longer be ignored. And that is the one of the mental health crisis globally. And just the term mental health and, oh, you have a mental health issue. Oh, you're seeing a shrink or you're a psychiatrist. You have to take prescriptions. You go into a 12 step meeting, anger management, you know, so whatever. Like people got um, compartmentalized in very unhealthy ways, right? And so it would make people hard to be vulnerable and honest and to share what they were going through. And so, when I saw some of these most recent statistics, uh, and I'll share a couple with you we were talking about before the show, only 5% of people in the workforce today, this is based on a survey of about a, a million um, respondents across Fortune 1000 companies. So this is not some small sample size. Only about 5% said they see any solid evidence that their workplace creates outlets to support mental health issues. That means 50,000 out of a million people, which means 950,000 people don't see the support they're working for at work. The other powerful statistic is nine out of 10 people. So 900,000 out of that 1 million people surveyed said the place where their stress comes greatest is from work. So yeah, this book, um, is like, I want everybody to read it. I'd be thrilled if we had 7 billion copies sold someday and all the language is necessary. But like practically, I mean, we have some big goals. We wanna see hundreds of thousands, even if not a million people pick this book up over the next year because who knows what curious, playful conspiracies for well-being get created when a million people start scratching their head and says, let's play more. And I know that's bigger than me, but I sure as heck wanna be an instigator. That's why I wrote the book. That's why our target are HR directors, C-suite leaders, organizational health associates, anybody who has influence with other people. Yeah, I double dog dare you to go download the book and read it. Cause like um, it's, it's generally specific on purpose. So it applies to all but we're building a whole subset of experiences and experiments 
that give people something to build on once they've uh, activated their own curiosity. Does that answer that? Absolutely. Something that <clears throat> my own challenge to the audience, you just threw down the gauntlet, right? To download the book. And I, yep. I second that and a different challenge. Just like in the beginning of our conversation today, when Steve mentioned those two kids who said, hey, mister, do you want to play? And that invitation changed everything. Every one of you who are listening to this conversation, every one of you who make the amazing decision to get this book of Steve's and you dive into it, you can now choose to be that person for somebody else, just like those kids were for Steve. You can be that agent of play, that agent of fun. You can show up and be playful and be curious and ask fun questions and even say, hey, come play with us. Now, they, that's right. they're free to say yes, they're free to say no, but that's got nothing to do with you, but you can make the invitation. Yeah, not only, and I'll, 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 I'll add something to that double dog dare. We just started a little campaign called Play It Forward. I know, I mean, the book's only twelve ninety five. It's 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 a couple Starbucks coffees for most people. But I know that even that right now is hard for a lot of people. So if that's not hard for you, then I'm going to encourage you to download the book, read it. It's because it's an electronic copy. And in, in the future, we can get Audible and we'll have print on demand for those who love having hard copies of books. But like, get it now, read it. And then like, you're going to do this anyway, but I want you to know, we want you to give the book away. But when you give it to them, after they read it, tell them to come up with a 12 bucks and then them give it away. Like a two for one. Like, I don't care if it's, you know, 10 for one, but like get the word out because play has a wild way of inviting possibility that other behaviors just don't bring to the table. And, um, yeah. And I, for, unless I forget this, you might even put it in the show notes. I don't know, but people can literally just go to play saves the day.com and that's where they can find the book. It'll be an Amazon and audible soon enough, but that's where it's at now. Yeah. Well, I, that'll definitely be in the show notes. A question that came to mind while you were speaking. So some of the people listening right now might be managers. They might be executives. They have teams that they have say in like a company culture, what goes on. If you were, let's say, like emperor of the earth for you know, for a year, and <laughs> the way that you, you know, dictate it, this is how you run a company. This is how you create a company culture. This is how you take care of your people. What would be a couple ideas that you could share that would really make a difference from what you've seen? Well, to start with, I, that's a great question you're asking because we're targeting people like that, right? We've already had two companies buy bulk copies of the book at a significant discount and then they're they're going to give it to each of their employees to read and the book actually has virtual experiments in it so it'll take you to a website it'll take you to a social media site it will give you a chance to connect with others and to give us valuable data in an anonymous format to help re um purpose to all of you so you can learn from it, right? But on the back side of that, what we're doing is we're inviting people to a virtual workshop called, hey, mister, do you want to play, right? And, and it's literally teaching people three simple principles that can dynamically transform any workplace in 90 days if adhered to. And so um, the first thing I would say to people who are in these roles the past is irrelevant. The less of your management style and your leadership principles and your understanding of culture that you usher to the future, the better. Like if you have the courage, put a whiteboard out in front of your office or your, your company or your you know, department head that you manage with the words blank slate and invite your team to improvise, to innovate, to ideate, to create together the, va the core values necessary for people to feel emotionally and safe and professionally curious and therefore fully engaged in being there. One of the biggest problems in the workplace today is for decades, the, and the disparity of the high-end C-suite leader salary and all the comp and perks and benefits to the average worker continues to grow. And until that gets lower. And until those dollars are poured into the development of the people at the core level of the company, like it's time to put the people before the profit. And when you do that, 
you will have more profit than you know what to handle. So my biggest invitation, like if I'm that emperor for the day, all right, control, alt, delete. You start your company new today. Maybe your product is the same, but you, you reimagine how you're going to, you know, engage your client. You redefine what the workplace feels like and looks like. You invest in your management to find ways to bring play into their professional tool belt. These are some of the things I'd share, I, I would do with people if they called me for sure. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. And by all yeah. means, uh, if you can share with me that link to that webinar or however people can get a hold of that and be on, be on there, well, we'll put that in the show notes as well. One thing yeah. that comes to mind is, you know, as I've shared with you and the audience before, you know, the foundation of my work is helping people create an extraordinary life without regret. And I'd love to ask you, Steve, what does an extraordinary life without regret mean to you, look like for you? Um, I love that. Um, and, you know, for a long time, I've lived with um, an acceptance that if I'm busy attempting to live my life without regret, I'm tiptoeing through the tulips of my own imperfections, meaning there are always things I'm going to fall short on because I'm not perfect. So um, I think what I would say is I would turn that a little bit and I would say, I'm not looking to live my life without regret. I'm looking to live it with celebration for mm -hmm. the things that went right. So I'm going to take chances. I'm going to participate fully. I'm going to live loudly. And when I win big, I'll celebrate with everybody else. And when I fall big, people will know because I went big and they'll be there to help support me. So like... As I look at my future, what it means to live this kind of life you're speaking of is to be fully connected with a group of people who resonate with the same values that I do so that I can be in the laboratory and no matter how many test tubes I blow up in experiment mode, know that I get to keep playing with my life to create the very, very best flow for me. And remember, what works for me will not work for Jamil or for, for you or the next person. We are all uniquely different. Mm -hmm. There may be um, common characteristics or things that thread themselves through all our lives, but because we express play differently, because we have different backgrounds, because we're curious about different things, different cultures, the, the formula is never the same. So um, yeah. I'm diving into play and, and you can be sure if any of your listeners ever come across me, they'll probably find me doing something goofy because I've committed every day to, to do something new that I've never done. Even if it's something simple, like yesterday, yesterday, no lie. I attempted to catch a rat on the waterway with a trap I made that I saw on um, naked and afraid. <laughs> Not that I wanted to keep, not that I wanted to keep the rat, right? But I was literally walking along the canal that leads out to the beach. And apparently there's some rats over there, which I thought was, ooh, that's gross. But I thought, well, this ought to be different. And I'd never done it before. And I spent an hour and a half waiting for that rat to fall under that trap. Um, it never did. And, um, but I had fun because I was doing something different, right? And I know that's silly and stupid and meaningless, but, um, you know, and then I watched this show this morning on uh, Chef's Table, and I like to cook. Um, and I thought, wow, I'm going to start experimenting with food differently than I have. Like, like tonight, I'm going to go to the grocery store and just do something wacky. And hopefully, it'll taste good, but it's going to be fun because I'm curious about it. Experimenting. So, For some, yeah. You know, some people, like I said earlier, some people that are listening are you know, just listening. Some people are with us on video regardless whether you just heard Steve or you are seeing and hearing Steve, so much of what he just shared, his energy just bounded. He just, the voice changed, the way he was carrying himself changed. And this is representative of what it can look like when you just step into your passion, your purpose, you're living from play, you're living from spirit, you're living from fun, you're living from enthusiasm. And there's an invitation and a loving challenge to every one of you. Find that version for you of whatever that- Can I get, yeah. You. And can I give you one object lesson that they'll never forget for those who actually can see it? Please, yeah. Okay, cool. So like, I am a huge believer in remembering things, right? You'll know when you're playing when you're mentally pliable. 
And, and so, for, so those, for me, for those that are listening, he's moving a slinky yes, up and down. Yeah. I'm moving a slinky. And if you, I think probably most people know what a slinky is. It's crunched up coils that you can make move all around and manipulate. Mine happens to be bright colors of the rainbow because when I grew up, it was just metal and it would rust. But like, <laughs> I keep this with me because I feel what stress feels like. I feel what rigidity feels like. I feel like I know what closed mindedness feels like. And when that shows up, time to get the slinky and start being mentally pliable. Say, okay, this is how I feel. But what if I gave myself permission to think and feel something different? Once again, experimenting. So if nobody ever did anything but get themselves a slinky, <laughs> it becomes an invitation to experiment with play. Yeah, I love that. And so I think uh, slinky sales are going to go through the roof now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't own slinky. <laughs> yeah. And so oh, g- given, it's a good thing. Uh, given all of that, all the wisdom that you've obtained, the life lessons you've learned, a fun question I love to play with, you know, if you were to, if you could go back in time, speak to 18 year old Steve, as you are now, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give him? Is there anything that you would ask him to start doing, stop doing, anything that you think would be helpful for him that someone who's listening oh. now around that age could learn from? Yes, him? yes. Um, and uh, and this has nothing to do with play. Um, however, at a very young age, four or five years old, I lived in a ho- household where white lies were part of the conditioning of our life. So I'd pick up the phone, I'd screen it for my mom or dad. I had to put my hand over the receiver. They'd ask who it was. When I told them, they would tell me what was convenient for them. And what generally was convenient after a hard day's work was, um, tell him he's out in the backyard, you'll have to call back tomorrow. Or, oh, she's out with friends or she's sleeping. And what I learned at a very, very young age is as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, if it assists you, then it's okay to lie. And by 18, I had perfected that craft. (laughs) <laughs> and it took me until my late 30s, almost 20 years ago, to really come to grips with how destructive of a life force that was and how it worked totally against the transformative process. Because remember, I also got brought up in that world where it was all about performance. So like you had to put on your best. So when I knew I didn't do my best, um, I still wanted to be loved. So I began lying or we like to soften it by saying embellishing or exaggerating, but it's still not the truth. And we have to ask ourselves why. So for, well, I wouldn't say just for young people, I'd say for all of us, this is a great opportunity to look at something. And um, play gives you the ability, pure play, to not give the rat's ass what anybody else thinks because you're totally comfortable in the moment. So whatever it is, it is. So there's no need to embellish, right? It's just, you know, uh, now it doesn't mean that kids don't embellish, but where does that generally come from? Well, maybe people will like me more, right? You know, and, and so the sooner we can get to the core of speaking truth to ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the business of transforming. Awesome, man. Thank you for sharing that. And so, My we, pleasure. so we, we just took a moment to play kind of with the past. And now yep. I want to take a moment to play in the future. And so mm-hmm. if you met future Steve, he lives a year in the future <laughs> and he's already achieved the success that you'd love to achieve over the next 12 months. How would he advise you now? Um, the same way he would advise me the last time I was asked this question in a, um, in a personal development class I took 11 years ago. Um, he would simply tell me the words, keep paddling you'll find your paradise. And let me give a little color to that. Like for me, I love being on the water. I love playing as you obviously come to see or hear through today's um, uh, show. And, um, and I love Hawaii. Well, there's, there's a lot of history and some mythology around how, how Hawaii was found, but, but there is this sense that to the very day, this energy and this physical representation is no longer here that I want to be going where I've never gone before. Mm. And so um, like, I don't see a Steve at 60 who has settled down. I actually have it in a notebook. Um, Also part of why I'm getting back in the gym. Like I got 10 years before it's my goal to climb Mount Everest at the age of 65. And um, that, 
simply requires a certain way of, of living and being and believing. And of course, I would never uh, put my life at risk in the sense that, you know, you go with someone trained well, and if they say you can't make it, you stop, you go down, no, no questions asked. But the premise of my curiosity says, wow, that'd be cool to look from the top of the world and, and, and say that I was seeing things like I've never seen them before, right? Like, um, and, and some people really kind of do those kinds of things because they're like trophies on their adventure belt. For me, I'm just curious what it would be like at 29,680 feet or whatever it was, right? Um, and maybe I'll get there, maybe I won't. But this is the premise of the way I see my life. Like, this may even sound silly to people, but like, I think it'd be really cool to live to 120 years old and be super healthy. Like, why not? Because, <laughs> and some people say, well, why would you want to live that long? Well, if you spent much of your life trying to figure out how to be happy and now you're happy. Um, so in short answer, the Steve a year from now is going to say, keep paddling, find <laughs> something new. <laughs> something that you said that, I hope people really latch on to that would be cool. Whatever that is for you. Yes. Dive in like lean. Yes, into that's that right. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Because, because cool looks different for all of us, but yeah. if it feels cool, that means it's curious to you. And that's where you get that transformative energy to really engage and change. Yeah. And some people might, feel you know that would be cool but then they think about it and then that story comes in of but i can't for all these reasons yep. and my loving invitation is what if you just questioned that story and said but what if i could do it like what mm -hmm. if it worked out and then notice how will i find out well i gotta try it's the only right. way i'm gonna know and yep. so as we wrap up steve i really thank you for you've been here for a good amount of time and as have the listeners I'd love to ask you, what is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? <sighs> hmm. No one's ever asked me that way. Um, probably everything about the last two years was nothing I wanted to do. Um, like I left Hawaii just before the pandemic. So I guess it's been about two and a half years um, to go help a guy with his business for three weeks, 21 days, and to get a little help on my business. Well, it was 21 months later, I came back. And the entire time I was on the mainland, I got forced to look at the deepest, darkest aspects of who I was and be real about them not hide them, ask for help with them, and not feel any guilt or shame about any of it. And the big mm -hmm. risk for me was that while the last eight, 10 years has been a work in practicing self-love and my first 45 years, very little of that, the last two years, I can honestly say, I demonstrably have been loving myself. So the big risk was at 53, being where I didn't want to be, doing what I didn't want to do, and somehow thinking in the end that would get me where I'm at today. And I mean, I kicked and screamed 25 months ago. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> and yet here we are. So yeah, big risk to love yourself and, and to let people close enough to give you the feedback necessary to get there. For everyone who's listening, I strongly encourage you to rewind a minute or two and re-listen to that answer because the secret to obtaining everything that you want is in the answer that Steve just said. And I'll leave it at that just so you go back if you're curious. <laughs> but the answer is all there. And so, Steve, how can our listeners learn more and connect with you? Well, two things. One, they can go to experimentwithplay.com, just like it sounds spelled out that way. That's our company website for Play Lab. Um, it's um, a total rebrand. So it's still a little loose, a little new. Um, however, there's a place for you to put your email in and to let us stay in touch with you. I promise we won't be pitching you or selling you or bothering you, but about once a month, we'll be send sending out something meaningful and useful. And because we've got some really cool and exciting things on the horizon, that's a way you can stay in touch. Um, the other way, of course, is to um, hop on Play Saves the Day. And there's actually an excerpt of the book there, some testimonials. You can actually check it out. 
to even determine if you want to um, to purchase it, but at least go look at that because when you do purchase it, a um, dollar of every pro of every book sale goes to seize the awkward.org, which helps support uh, mental health awareness and having difficult discussions. And that's really important to us. And, um, you know, if you want, you can follow me on social media. We put a, an experiment out there called the fun frequency. I'm in that fairly uh, regularly. And um, I'd say those probably be the best ways to just kind of uh, come down the yellow brick road of play with us. <laughs> I love that, man. First of all, I want to just acknowledge and recognize you for the immense work you've done on yourself, all the good you're doing Thank in you. the world. And I wish you nothing but success. I'm excited to get my copy of the book. And again, and strongly encourage everyone, at least click the link, check it out, see if it's for you. If today's call resonated with you, listen to it again. Steve drops some massive nuggets of wisdom that I think can really transform your life. And if this resonated with you, please feel free to leave a review on Apple or wherever you're watching this or listening to this. It really goes a long way. It helps other people see it as it goes up the algorithm and subscribe. If this is, uh, if you're loving these conversations, there's plenty more in the pipeline. And so I'd love for you to keep experiencing them. And Steve, is there anything you'd like to say before we close for today? Just that, like always, Jamil, every time we get together, I like to use the word riff. You know, there, there was no set agenda today. There were just some things that you wanted to kind of highlight, and, and we just took it where it goes. And, and I, I would just uh, say thank you so much for giving me space to share my crazy, zany ideas <laughs> that I think are going to become more and more mainstream all the time. And um, just um, just really grateful for you, what you're doing, and and. I, I mean, like this is the fifth one I've done this week. And every time I get a chance to share this, I feel like like we're really making a difference. So it means a lot that you would let us be able to get our message out to your listening audience. And so, so grateful and so excited to see what comes for you and your new podcast as well. We'll be promoting it. So just remember, play saves the day. Much aloha. It definitely does, man. And so again, thank you so much. You know, as I mentioned in closing, you know, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regrets, a life on your terms. If I can be of service to you, I'd love to have a conversation, see if or how I can help you. You can check me out at jamilsayage.com, on Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayage, it's DR and then my name, and on Facebook at Jamil Sayage. I'll have the links there as well as everything Steve shared so you can dive into them. So again, Steve, thank you so much. Everyone who's tuned in today, thank you again. Really appreciate you being here. Your attention is the greatest you know, resource that there is. So thank you so much for giving it to us for the last hour 20 or so. And finally, what I have found is that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they get stuck. But you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. So what will you do? Think about our conversation that we had today. What can you take from it? And how can you apply it? You know, It's not knowledge is power, knowledge is potential power. When you apply it, your whole life can change. So get clear on what that is then go do it. Create a meaningful day. All my love. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.